Uh, but we're here this morning to study God's Word, and we're looking at Psalm 46. So, uh, guys, if you'd give out Bibles for those who want them, that'd be great, although the words will appear on the screen behind me in a moment. Psalm 46. So do uh, open your Bible or uh, turn it on if you're computer literate and you've got your tablet with you. Some of us are old enough to be taking tablets, others enough using tablets. Uh, whichever your uh, uh, preference is, if you could find Psalm 46 and it'll be on the screen behind me as well. Why are we taking this this morning? Uh, uh, I'm grateful to Malcolm for his invitation to preach. Uh, uh, rather unusually, uh, uh, I was given freedom to choose. Now, I don't in any way uh, begrudge being given a topic. In some ways, as Malcolm will tell you, it's easier if you're given a topic. You just prepare around that part of God's word. Uh, but I chose this uh, this morning, feeling that God wanted to speak to us uh, a word of encouragement from Psalm 46. This is wonderfully encouraging. Put on your encouraged face. It's, it's amazing. This is so encouraging, it will encourage you if you're discouraged. And if you're not discouraged this morning, you'll regret not being discouraged. This is so good. Uh, you'll want to be encouraged because it's so amazing, this psalm, building us up, pointing to God and his care and compassion for us. And I was particularly affected because the events of the nation have created uncertainty. So your neighbours and mine are, are facing, particularly following the period of the party political conferences, uh, a knowledge that 2017 is going to be an uncertain year. Theresa May has indicated that uh, Article 50 will be triggered in the first quarter of next year and will be on a two-year roller coaster ride to work out uh, whether Brexit really means Brexit and what that, what that actually means. Hard Brexit, soft Brexit, sounds like eggs, doesn't it? Scrambled exit. Uh, I have no idea quite what kind of Brexit we're going to get. Uh, I was amused uh, at the Tory party conference when uh, a minister who blamed the autocue for this pronunciation announced with confidence to the gathered crowd and don't forget breakfast means breakfast and then he realized that he slightly misread the autocue um, So the truth is, despite the fact that the bottom didn't fall out of our world the day after the referendum, as some had prophesied, uh, and that uh, although the pounds are to 31-year low and the FTSE is in amazingly high and positive territory and there are confusing financial signals, and the truth is that in 2017, no one knows <laughs> where the economic markets are going. No one knows the political situation and the fallout that's going to be happening. Uh, and so people feel uncertain. What will it mean for their job? What will it mean for the jobs of their family and the prospects for their family? What will it mean about the security issues around the nation and so on? So into that world of uncertainty, I thought we'd look at Psalm 46. I hope it's going to be on the screen uh, behind me. Um, uh, Malcolm's kindly lent his, his uh, magic pointer to me uh, this morning, which I've, uh, I've already felt the... Uh, the Duncan glow by having this uh, uh, pointer, which worked, there it is. You see, it works so well. Uh, and I'd like to give you a whistle-stop tour through this psalm so that you can understand it. If, as I go on, I lapse into Northern Irish, you know how powerful this, uh, this actual thing is here. Oh, Psalm 46. Now, actually, if you've got a Bible open, what's missing from the screen there that you can see in your Bible? The answer is there's an introduction in the NIV, uh, and that introduction talks about the sons of Korah, maybe the choir, and, an, and a very strange word, Almanoth, it rarely appears. It means, probably means, girls. And so it looks like, unusually in the Psalms, and don't forget the Jews. Sorry, guys, I know you can't see me too well up there, but um, I'll be back up the top in a minute. Um, and it's more important that you read the scripture uh, at, the, at the moment. Um, it looks like this is one of those rare psalms in which there's a soprano part. And therefore, girls and guys, the whole people of God, are involved in singing and proclaiming together the truths of this psalm. And so it's, it's us. We're here this morning, like a Jewish community, celebrating men and women how great God is. So verse 1 says, God is our refuge. That's like a... Uh, a castle. 
It's a very negative thing. It's an escape. It's a hidey hole away from trouble. And then strength is a positive word. It means you can run out into the storm and you've got the strength and the courage to deal with the difficulties. And so the psalmist gives us a negative protection, refuge, and a positive strength from God to move out and to cope with difficulty. An ever-present help in trouble. Very interesting phrase. It means that God is present and he is also helping. So he's not just present, he's helping as well. How many of you have received invitations to a party that say this? No presence, only your presence. Some of you must have had invitations to parties that say that. Because, you see, the person really wants you to go. Whether you buy them something, you know, if you like... I'm, we're, I'm invited now, I'm getting older, invited to lots of sort of 50th wedding anniversaries, uh, 60th wedding anniversaries, 100th wedding anniversaries, you know. Um, and frankly, most people have got everything they could conceivably need ever. So why buy them a trinket they don't really want? It would only go on their mantelpiece and their children are only going to have to sort it out in the future. That is a fact, by the way. So the key thing here is not that God helps alone, but he's present and he helps. That God is with us. And we'll think in a minute about that's true, even when we don't feel it. So, here's how this song, remember it's a song, singing it together. Next verse, please. Therefore, we will not fear, though, and then these early verses are about physicality. They're about natural disasters, earthquakes, volcanoes, tidal waves, problems in nature are reflected here, therefore we will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea. Verse 3. Though its waters roar. Imagine reading this in Haiti this week. The waters roar and foam. The mountains quake with their surging. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God. Now, is water a bad image or a good image in this psalm? <laughs> yes, yeah. the answer is yes, because roaring waters on the one hand and healing streams on the other. I, I told them this morning at the, the nine o'clock service, interesting here, some Dutch co uh, commentators and theologians have commented on this in a quite interesting way that I've never read uh, in Western uh, commentaries. Uh, in 1574... A city in the Netherlands was besieged by an advancing king. They were praying for deliverance. The siege had gone on some while. And, you know, there's lots of water in the Netherlands, very low-lying. And a flood came early one October morning in 1574. And the flood destroyed the advancing army of the king. And what's more, the fleet that had come to rescue them was unable to get much nearer the city because they could ride up closer on the flood tide. And so they went to the cathedral. And the historians record this sentence. We have defeated the advancing king by putting our trust in the king of kings. And this psalm is quoted. Because it's a river, it's a water flow that brings rescue. So sometimes water brings devastation, sometimes it brings rescue. And the psalmist uses water in both a positive and a negative aspect. So it makes glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. Thank you. God is within her, she won't fall. And you see why the people in Holland were... You know, excited by this, as if he didn't fall. God will help her at break of day, at, at the last minute. Um, just as you think the darkness is going to go on forever, <sighs> dawn breaks. Uh, and sometimes I think of our God as a last minute God, if I can say that reverently. Just rescuing us at the last minute. Thank you. Nations are in uproar. Kingdoms fall. He lifts his voice. The earth melts. So this isn't physical trauma. This is political and economic and military trauma. Uh, read your newspaper. Read this verse in the other hand. How appropriate is this in our world today? Next. Thank you. The Lord Almighty is with us. Translated in the old translation as the Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob, he's historically always been with us, is our fortress. Now this is the chorus. So you've had the first verse. 
the early opening verses. And then the chorus, this, and the chorus is repeated at the end, just like contemporary songs. Stuff, chorus, some more stuff. That's how hymns are written. Charles Wesley, um, Stuart Townend, all these guys write hymns and songs with progress. The first verse says something, the second verse says something else, building usually on the first verse. That's what the psalm does. So that the psalm takes us on a musical journey of theological discovery, which is what a good song or hymn is supposed to do. And so you get a chorus to repeat in this verse and the last verse to remind us what the psalm focuses on. And then you get to the next bit, verse 8. Come! Actually, the old translations say, behold! It's a prophetic behold, because this section is about the future. So, God is our refuge and strength now, the opening verse, chorus, and then the second verse, it's the future. God's going to rescue us in the future. He's great now, but he's going to be wonderfully great also in the future going forward, because this hasn't happened yet, as you'll see in a minute, but it, it is guaranteed God's deliverance, future-wise, is certain. And so the psalmist gathers the people of God together to celebrate. He's helpful now, and you can trust him, because he's going to be helpful on and on and on into the future. So, come and see the works of the Lord. Can we just have that verse a minute? Verse 8. Is it, is it possible to go back? Thank you. Come and see the works of the Lord, the desolations he has brought on the earth. Verse 9. He makes war cease, that clearly hasn't happened yet, to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow, shatters the spear, burns the shields, or some translations have chariots. Anyway, the enemy military weaponry hardware is destroyed with fire. Verse 10, most famous verse in this psalm. Be still. James helpfully focuses on that at the beginning. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted in the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. And here's the chorus. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. What a great psalm that is. A reminder that God is in the present, our refuge and strength, and prophetically in the future, is also going to be our refuge and strength. So let's just think about that briefly today and celebrate it together. Just be excited about what God has provided for us. This God is our refuge and strength. He is an ever-present help in trouble. Now, I've said from this pulpit on numerous occasions over the years that this is not a matter of whether we feel God's presence. It's the reality of God's presence with us. And it's partly as understanding this, men and women singing this song in the ancient world, praising God as they were in the, uh, the tabernacle, wandering around the wilderness or in a temple built by uh, Solomon or wherever they were in corporate acts of worship, they were doing it together. Because you know when you're on your own, have you noticed how it's so easy to believe in God in church? He seems so powerful and present, doesn't he? We're together, we're singing, thank God. He, he's, he's here. But tomorrow morning, in front of that class of children or in the workplace, wherever that is, or shopping or looking after young children, or doing whatever we do tomorrow morning, we feel like we're on our own. And God doesn't feel quite so close to us in that setting. So we've got to imagine, as we go to work tomorrow, there's this great choir of Gold Hill Baptist Church singing, God is our refuge and strength, behind us, affirming us, supporting us, cheering us on. Wouldn't you be more confident tomorrow if, you could, if, they, were, if they were invisibly there? And people were nagging you and criticizing you, mocking your faith, not behaving particularly well. And all the time you've got a big smile on your face because you can hear the heavenly chorus behind you saying, God is our refuge and strength. That's the point of this corporateness, affirming who God is. And that's why we worship God together, because on our own, we have a tendency to be weak and emotionally insecure. God's presence is with us because we gather and we must remember constantly that his presence doesn't leave us when we don't feel him so when we don't feel god's near that doesn't mean he isn't near his presence goes with us i've been married for 35 years uh, i enjoy being with my wife uh, uh, it's uh, uh, a wonderfully happy and positive experience uh, she's here at the second service i 
if you would listen to the recording from the first service, I, I wasn't quite so positive, but I, I would have been. I would have been. I love my wife very much, and it's great that uh, uh, I sense her presence when we are together. But you need to know that tomorrow when I leave to go to Guatemala and I sit down to my first major meal in the hotel, she has me on some sort of diet thing at the moment which involves lettuce and air. <laughs> uh, I will feel her presence. <laughs> How many husbands understand what I'm talking about right now? Yeah, I know, yeah, no. That gentle, nagging, I mean, encouraging <laughs> voice. Don't eat that. Don't have that. That's not on the diet. Because though we are physically separated, her influence after all these years remains strong. My brothers and sisters, God is with us whether we are physically with the people of God or physically absent from them. Whether we're in church as a building or out of church in the workplace or the home, God is still God. And he wants to say to you, I am a very present help in trouble. I'm not just there when you're in the corporate gathering of the people of God. We must move swiftly on. Notice verse 2 and 3. God is present when disaster strikes. How much comfort do they need in the homes of the thousand dead in Haiti this week? How much comfort do they need in the far fewer numbers, but still tragic, deaths on the eastern seaboard of the United States. What about the loss of life uh, in um, so many natural disasters? God, will you be in those situations a very present help in time of trouble? And then notice the political things. Verse 6, nations are in uproar, kingdoms fall, he lifts his voice, the earth melts. This is a world of incredible turmoil. And people have fear. And one of the reasons that fear increases, by the way, is that we have 24-hour news. And 24-hour news constantly bombards us. It needs to be full of something. And uh, since the start of the print media, actually, a century ago, newspaper editors had a very simple uh, uh, motif for how they delivered the news. It was in this sentence, if it bleeds, it leads which means if there's a disaster, if it's exciting, if there's blood everywhere, if there's a problem, make it the central story. So what we have is we're bombarded day in, day out by the, the hellish horror of Aleppo, which is terrible whether we see it or not, but it, it's constantly shown to us the disaster which is Iraq, the ongoing problems of Somalia which are not on our TV screens. They say, uh, read this week in a, in, in a private international briefing, uh, that the relationship between America and Russia has never been so poor since the Gold War. So, so it's a pretty insecure world in which we live. What will happen in the military expansionism of Russia? Is Crimea the end, or do the Baltic states need to get ready to be next? What's going on? What will happen in the resolution in Iraq and Syria? Who knows? And in all of that maelstrom of uncertainty, politically, militarily, and sometimes naturally, God says, I am your refuge and strength. And the reminder is for us, in the world of uncertainty and fear, to embrace the truth that God loves us and is the place where we can hide and the person who gives us strength as we embrace these challenges. Because challenges they are, and challenges that are real. And the healing river of God wants to come to us and help us with them. The Lord Almighty, this phrase, which was the Lord of hosts, is a decidedly military metaphor. God's armies are bigger than any of the armies of the world, is the implication. Many secular cynics don't believe that God still has a place in the world. In the middle of the last century, uh, Stalin remarked cynically about the Pope, how many divisions does the Pope have? I'm not afraid of him. 
Lots of people uh, doubt religious or spiritual power. But we remind ourselves in the face of relentless news broadcasting that shows political and military and economic uncertainty that actually God is on, in control and on the throne and isn't an absent God. He's a present God and he has the power and capability to help. And sometimes it doesn't feel like that and sometimes it's an enormous pressure to believe it but it is nevertheless true. And not only is it true now, it's true in the future. Verse 8 following. He makes wars cease, not done yet, to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow, shatters the spear. This psalm says, and the future is also, the ultimate future is in God's hands. So how should we respond this morning? Verse 10. Be still and know that I am God. This is the, the, the Hebrew equivalent of the Greek uh, words and the, the lovely New Testament story where Jesus is on a lake and there's a storm and Jesus says to the storm, be still. It, it, it's the word, it, Jesus uses the word used to calm a yapping dog. Be quiet. Be still. And, and this doesn't mean uh, just don't move physically. Though our young people this morning were, were deeply impressive in their capacity to sit still for a minute. And goodness, I'm not sure my grandchildren could sit still for uh, a minute. I'm not sure I could um, at, their, uh, at their age. So it doesn't just mean be still physically. It means stop fussing, stop fighting, stop being agitated. Stop it. The children of Israel, you see, needed that. Maybe this psalm is written with an advancing Sennacherib army uh, uh, coming, or at least written with, with uh, some of that in view. No one knows, by the way, at, at what point it would have been sung and or written. Maybe there was an actual invasion on top of them, or maybe they just had a victory of some uh, kind. It, it, it's, it's real. And the great challenge for us is that the, the reality they felt, because it was on them all the time, they were always attacked by Amalekites or Philistines or Hittites or Gergesites or heaven knowsites all around them. They were always under attack. So it was real for them. Our problem, you see, is there's a huge dislocation in our society between a Sunday worship service and the week. And so we live our lives in two compartmentalized, completely separate words, worlds. And we're happy to say God's in charge here, but we're very nervous about saying God's in charge of the nations. But the reality has to be, if the Bible is to be believed, that God is in charge of the nations. Even if that doesn't appear to be the case so much of the time. So stop fussing, the psalmist says. Stop agitating yourself. Stop all the time being worried and nervous because the Lord is your refuge and strength. And he is going to be exalted among the nations. And of course, the New Testament unpacks what the Old Testament merely hints at. That the day is coming when there'll be a new heaven and a new earth and the lion will lie down with the lamb and there will be this global peace that that's coming uh, in the new heaven and the new earth and, and our future is, is secure in that regard. So here's a fabulous hymn song with two major verses and things. God's our present help in trouble now. And by the way, if you're worried about the future, and, and many of us are, make this as the final point as we close this morning, many of us are worried about the future personally. Because, you see, when you're 17 or 18 or 19, you're immortal. No harm can befall you. But then things happen, including marriage and children. And all of a sudden, the world becomes rather more fragile. We have worries about our kids, about our aging parents, about our grandchildren. And as we get older, worries about our health. I had no concerns at all about my health at 19. I remember someone saying to me, an, an older man, I was a teenager, and, and he, was old, he was really, really old. I think he was 41, 42. <laughs> uh, seemed really old to me. He said this to a group of us. He said, you're fine now, he said, but I'll tell you this, if you're over 40 and you wake up and something doesn't hurt, you're dead. <laughs> Well, a somewhat cynical view of old age, I would, I would say. But I can tell you this. 
As we get older, we do worry about the future. How's our health going to work out? What's going to happen to our kids, our grandchildren? What's, what's going on, God? So you see, what we have, those of us who are middle-aged and older, is, is that we have natural disaster, political turbulence and uncertainty, all wrapped up in personal uncertainty about the future and where it's going, about work and home and health. And this song, you see, is meant to be sung together, celebrated together, affirmed together. Together we believe, whatever our age and whatever our stage of life, single, married, big family, small family, no family, strong in faith, new to faith, wherever we are, the truth of God's word stands secure. God is our strength and refuge. Stop fussing, because he's, he's in charge. It may not look like it. But the word of God stands secure in every age and generation and will be relied upon until we die and, like blessed, lovely Ruth Stanilland, are promoted to glory. And until we're all in that state or Jesus returns, the word of God remains. Stop fussing. God's our refuge and strength. Amen.